Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> Good morning, Heart of Longmont. Good morning. Are we ready to rock and roll this morning? We're going to do just that. So we're going to sing and dance the way David sang and danced before the Lord. Let's stand as we're able and uh, we will sing our first song. church. How are you doing today? Welcome to the heart of Logmont, and uh, we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us. Thank you, God's House Band, for getting us started today. Uh, if you are new here, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us today. There are little cards in the pew rack in front of you. We'd love to know that you've been with us today, and so if you would fill one of those out, and then later on in the service when the collection plates come by, uh, that could be what you put in the collection plate for us. We would love to know that you're here. Uh, those of you who are fairly regular attenders, if you would sign in on the uh, pew pads and pass them down to give everybody a chance to fill those out, that'd be great for uh, us to be able to know that you've been with us. Our bulletin is chock full with some interesting and important information. We have our uh, monthly spaghetti dinner this coming Wednesday night, uh, Feeding Our Souls. You can read about it here. It's been fun and a good time for fellowship and some great food. Uh, we have an Ash Wednesday worship coming up here in a few weeks as we begin the season of Lent, uh, heading into Easter, uh, inviting you to join me for lunch in a couple of weeks, especially those of you for whom 
uh, this may be a new experience being here at Heart of Longmont. If, if this is a new church for you and you want to find out more about this particular uh, church, the history of it, so we're the oldest Protestant church here in Longmont, or if you'd like to know more about our United Methodist denomination or whatever, I invite you to sign up on the uh, hospitality desk out there. There's a place for you to fill in, to let us know that you'd like to have lunch with me and several of our other church leaders uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. So if you could sign up, that helps us know how many to plan for for the lunch. Other items in here too for uh, you to be sure to read through and find out what's happening. Our calendar here, lots of good things happening. Right now, I want to invite you to stand and welcome each other in the name of Christ this morning. When I was asked to present this mission moment, I went to my computer to get details of what has happened during our relationship with a wonderful organization. Who knew that I would only have to add to what has been written since I last presented almost two years ago today. Throwback Thursday takes us back to 2013 when the heart of Longmont becomes a drop-off location for donations of new or gently used bras to be given to free the girls and assist in helping survivors of human trafficking. Secondhand clothing is a profitable market in many countries around the world, and bras are usually sought-after items. Some of the girls in the Free the Girl program are making three to five times the minimum wage in their community selling bras. Our local UMW coordinates the efforts of folding, packaging, distributing the bras on an ongoing basis. Our 2013 Spring Sling Bra Drive brought in nearly 1,500 bras and over $600 was raised for Free the Girls. Bravo, church! Fast forward to 2017, and we have either shipped or delivered 6,000 bras to Free the Girls warehouses. Free the Girls is an international nonprofit organization devoted to coming alongside sex trafficking, sex trafficking survivors with a path to true freedom. It's a journey from horrific trauma to reintegrate into the life that these girls were meant to live within their family and community. Their goal for true freedom is measured by economic freedom, restored health, social well-being, education, and opportunity for a different, hopeful future. All this from a bra, and a used one at that. Here we are in 2019, and Free the Girls provides services in Mozambique, Uganda, El Salvador, and will soon be assisting survivors in Costa Rica. In 2013, our collection of 1,500 bras helped provide 30 
50,000 bras to eager survivors in Mozambique. That was the first shipment that made it over there. The end of 2018, Free the Girls reached the one millionth bra collected milestone. National Freedom Day is being celebrated by Free the Girls on March 14th, and as a drop-off location, we are invited to share our story and help increase the awareness of mission to help as well as share the stories of the women and families we have helped. So how can you help? Ladies, scour your drawers for the bra that just doesn't quite fit anymore or doesn't go with your new shoes or hair color. Sponsor a bra drive. Use our spring sling name to draw attention in your neighborhood or workplace. Donate a new bra. Donate a buck. The cost to ship bras is not cheap. Educate yourself and your family about the reality of human trafficking. Become an advocate for those affected by this social disease. Join the CNN Freedom Project on March 14th for hashtag My Freedom Day when students around the world will be holding events to raise awareness of modern slavery. I've left printed material out in our gallery for you to take and share. Look for more information in upcoming church publications about Free the Girls and how you can provide continued support. Good morning. The anthem we're going to sing today is called Keep Your Lamps, an African-American spiritual based on Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. The virgins had been told that the bridegroom would be coming, so they got their lamps, trimmed them, and set them burning, and went to the appointed place. But the bridegroom did not arrive at the appointed time, and the foolish had only brought enough oil for one night. They returned to get more oil, and of course, the bridegroom came while they were away. Jesus then says to his disciples, You know not the day nor the hour of my return. Be ye ready. As you listen to this anthem, try to imagine a slave hearing this passage of scripture and the song rising up out of his or her soul. Jesus was indeed a deliverer and a hope for the slave. This song was probably sung often, whenever there was a possibility of deliverance. Keep your lamps.
choir. That was wonderful. And I'm glad it's a large choir because I was so involved in it, I forgot I was supposed to be coming up here. I also like the really large print, so I won't need to read, use my reading glasses. And for those of you who don't know, I am Merlene Barner, happy to be here and serve as liturgist today. As we continue the series of King David, we move from readings found in 1 Samuel to ones from 2 Samuel. And it is here that David finally becomes king. One of his first acts is to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. It is a joyous celebration, but not everyone enters into the joy of the occasion. Hear these words from the sixth chapter of 2 Samuel. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went into Bel Judah so bring up, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Yuzah and Aiho, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Aho went in front of the cart of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished the offering of burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people. The whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all of the people went back to their homes. May God bless the reading and hearing of God's inspired words from the Bible. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Merlene. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable, be pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. King Saul, the first king of Israel, is dead. Long live the king. But who should that new king be? As we continue this sermon series on the life and times of David, we, the sermon series has lasted about as long as the reign of David. I realize that, but we'll be keep continuing to move through. Um, we're looking at various segments of David's life. We've seen how the prophet Samuel had anointed Saul to be the king, but when Saul disobeyed God, God sent Samuel to anoint someone else. And that someone turned out to be a young shepherd named David. Saul's kingdom would end. Saul's sons would not inherit the throne. When David is anointed king, he is probably just a young boy in his teens at this time. And so, over these last few weeks, we've heard how David's life has taken him from the shepherd's fields to the battlefields, to battle Goliath. It's taken him to the palace of Saul as Saul's musician, armor bearer, and as his army commander. We have seen how Saul, gripped with a jealous madness, tried to kill David, even though Saul's son, Jonathan, 
and Michael, Saul's daughter, both love David. And last week we saw how the mighty have fallen when Saul and his three sons all die in battle against the Philistines. So by this time, perhaps another 15 years have transpired since David was anointed the next king, and David could very well be close to 30 years of age. David becomes king, and he shrewdly decides to move the seat of power to a centrally located spot, a place where all the nation could come and have a brand new capital. And so he picks a place called Jerusalem. And it's here that King David brings his wives and his concubines that he's attached himself to during his years of exile, fleeing Saul. He brings all of his children at that time, and it's here in Jerusalem that David is reunited then with his first wife, Saul's daughter, Michael. Jerusalem, the city set on the hill. A rich history this city has already had. Uh, it's built over the spot where it was believed that I, Isaac was taken by his father Abraham as a sacrifice and how God spared Isaac at the last moment by providing a lamb in his place. A very sacred spot in the rich history of the Old Testament and here David decides to make this the capital. Now the king of Tyre, a nation just to the north, gave David uh, a wonderful welcoming gift. He sent him lots of cedar, cedar of Lebanon and gold for David to build his palace there in Jerusalem. And it's here that David begins to envision a very bold new building, not his own palace. David lives in a fancy palace made of the cedar and gold, but he is sort of heartbroken in that God does not have a place in which to dwell. He wants to build God a temple. Now we may find such ideas somewhat strange since we believe that the Spirit of God is in all places, moving in the hearts of all people. But for David and for the people of his day, they had their stories of the great Ark of the Covenant, which was said to house the very presence of God. Now we may be familiar with the Ark of the Covenant from that great Steven Spielberg movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, we have to remove some of our notions about the Ark that we got from that movie and revisit what the Bible says about the Ark. It is first mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, where God instructs Moses to build this chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubic and a half wide, and a half cubic high. Now a cubic, for those of you who may have forgotten your ancient geometry, <laughs> is about the length of your forearm, okay? And so inside this ark are several very incredible items. The stone tablets that God gave to Moses containing the Ten Commandments. There was also a jar in there that contained some of the miraculously preserved manna that the children of Israel ate while they were going through the wilderness. And also in the ark was the walking stick of Moses' brother Aaron. Uh, this was a stick that had miraculously budded out. And so all of these things are hundreds of years old, contained in the ark. And if there is one national treasure that the Jews had, it was the Ark of the Covenant. Once the Hebrews had moved 
into the promised land. Following Moses' death, the ark was housed in what was called the tabernacle, sort of a big canvas tent. And it went several places as uh, the nation slowly started to get formed. And there's a very weird and crazy story about the Ark of the Covenant that happens before David brings it into Jerusalem. I don't have the time, unfortunately, to go into it today, but it's found in the first book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. And if you want to know more, I would invite you to see me after worship, grab a cup of coffee, find me, and I will tell you about the weird and wonderful story of the Philistines and the golden hemorrhoids. <laughs> it's, it's in there, folks, believe me. Just pique your curiosity. So now David is ready to bring the ark into Jerusalem, okay? This is the high point of David's life. Everything before now has been leading up to this. He is king. He has made Jerusalem his capital. And now he will bring the greatest treasure of the Hebrew people to the city. It's like the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter all rolled into one. And there's also a very huge political component to this, the bringing together of all of the tribes of Israel under one leadership. There are obvious religious and spiritual overtones as well. It's a time for feasting. And as we heard in the reading, David uses this opportunity to provide food for all of Jerusalem, in fact, all of Israel. Everybody got some cakes and raisins and meat. And so from a farm several miles away where the ark had been kept, David now leads a throng of people as the ark is paraded into Jerusalem. So overcome with joy and ecstasy that David sheds his clothes and dances nearly naked before the ark. It's an exuberant sight. It is a festival and a celebration. Those of you who may have seen the Richard Gere movie from the 80s where the, he plays King David, the scene where David brings in the ark is fabulously done. I highly recommend it. And so this wonderful procession is happening, but from her bedroom window, David's wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, watches the whole spectacle, and the Bible says that she despises David in her heart. This is an artist's depiction, a woodcut by Granger, and there is Michael sitting in her window watching David. And when she finally gets a chance to talk to David, she chides him for his nearly naked revelry. How could you do that in front of all the common village girls, she says. Is that any way for a king to behave? Is that the way to worship God with such undignified behavior? Now we wonder about that sometimes today, don't we? At least I do. What is appropriate behavior for our leaders. There are many times recently where I question whether our political leaders are really acting like leaders, sometimes more like spoiled little children. But not always. I mean, I remember when that shooting happened at the Charleston Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church several years ago. And President Barack Obama went to the memorial service for those people who were killed there. And as he spoke, he talked about grace. And that thought moved him to tears. And not only tears, but he broke out in a song, unrehearsed song, and sang the first verse of Amazing Grace. Now there were some who said that that was a little too much. 
the President of the United States crying and singing slightly off key, not a good example. But I beg to differ. For me, I was greatly moved by his actions. He was helping, I think, that church and the whole nation to mourn. His honest emotions helped many of us to be honest with our own emotions. And so David is trying to help his nation to celebrate, and he dances. Many of the Psalms call on God's people to worship with music and song and dance. The book of Ecclesiastes says there's a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Outside of biblical passages on dancing, many early church leaders wrote about the celebration of life expressed through dance. Clement of Alexandria, one of the early church fathers, so to speak, was the first to describe Christian worship in which a torchlight choral dancing was a significant feature. Hippolytus imagined Jesus as the leader of the sacred dance who directs the movements of the church. Even John Wesley, father of Methodism, was known to dance. In his journals, we're told that when he would visit uh, Root or Epworth, he would dance with his sisters almost every evening while he was there. However, in 1876, about a hundred years after John Wesley's death, the Methodist General Conference took a decidedly harsher view of dancing. I have here, look at this, this is an 1896 Book of Discipline. Um, it's grown a little bit <laughs> over the years. And there's a section in here Paragraph 248, imprudent and unchristian conduct. Mm, yeah, mm, is right. <laughs> uh, things that you would expect like uh, intoxicating liquors, um, becoming bondsmen. Uh, but listen to this, dancing playing at games of chance, attending theaters, dancing parties, or patronizing dancing schools. Now that was listed as imprudent and unchristian conduct. The pastor was supposed to chastise anyone caught doing that, and if they didn't shape up, they were to be expelled from the church. Well, fortunately, Around World War I, that ban was lifted. Uh, Jesus never banned dancing. I can imagine him dancing maybe even with the other men in the village during weddings or bar mitzvahs. He exemplified life as a joyous response to God's love. And that's what I think the dance is really all about. It can be a wonderful metaphor for the way we respond to this gift from God called life. Sometimes the dance is slow, like a slow waltz. Sometimes it's a fast jitterbug. Sometimes it's just a free-flowing movement to the music of our lives. Everyone's dance is slightly different. Sometimes, sometimes we do step on each other's toes. David danced before the Lord. The text doesn't say he danced with great grace and skill, but with all his might. He threw his whole being into it. Throwing your whole being into worship, into life, exuberance. I also love that part of the story that David is so moved by the joy of the Lord that he distributes food to all the people. David is so blessed, he wants to bless others. The generosity inspired by his worship reaches across the entire nation to every family and person. 
Being generous is what we do when we ourselves have been blessed. I want to give you a, an update on how we did with our stewardship emphasis last fall. You re might remember that we focused on who we are as the heart of Longmont. The ministries that we engaged in, the people that have been involved in missions, the lives that have been touched as a result of your generosity. Those of you who got your year-end giving statements read the report from our finance chair, Mark Vancura. But for those who have not seen the report, I want to share the good news with you. Last year, for the 2018 budget of last year, we had 90 estimate of giving cards turned in. For this year, for the 2019 budget, we had 98 cards turned in. And the amount pledged this year is over $23,000 more than the year before. That's incredible, friends. Thanks to all of you for making ministry happen. Thanks to our great finance team. Thanks to Tim and Kathy Bradley for spearheading that stewardship emphasis. You are a congregation of exuberant generosity. Oh, my happy dance. Life can, oh, that felt good. Oh. Life can and should be a dance, my friends. This is coming up James Tissock's drawing of David dancing before the Lord. James wanted to put some more clothes back on David. But that's one artist's dis dis depiction. And here's another one, a stained glass piece by Mike Angel. David dances before the ark. That's the lesson. David teaches us this week, as you are living your life, if you have a chance to sit it out like Michael did from her bedroom window watching life pass you by and criticizing those who danced, or if you have a chance to dance with passion, with excitement, with risk, with joy, with exuberance, like David did, well, I hope you dance. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your love. That is just amazing. Thank you that you have blessed us and in so many ways, we try to be blessings to others. Thank you for those opportunities. Thank you for the example of David and for the lessons we can learn. But Lord, may your spirit continue to give us joy, to help us look for those opportunities to maybe not physically dance, but live with exuberance, to live with excitement, to take risks and Share the joy. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Well, we are going to have a chance to uh, dance before the Lord right here and now. So anyone that wants to stand and sing with us, we would just love it. David, after that amazing display of dancing, I really think you all need to get up here and, and dance with us. So hey, we at least have to clap and carry on. So let's stand as we're able and sing together. Undignified. <laughs> Sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering this passion in my soul. I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering this passion in my soul. I will dance, 
I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing more is hindering this passion in my soul. I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing more is hindering this passion in my soul. more undignified than this Some may say it's foolishness And I will become even more undignified than this I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king I think Lord is hindering this passion in my soul I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king, nothing Lord is hindering this passion in my soul, and I will become even more undignified than this. Though some may say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more undignified than this. Leave my pride by my side, and I'll become even more undignified than this. Though some may say it's foolishness, and I'll become even more undignified than this. I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering this passion in my soul. I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering this passion in my soul. And I will become even more undignified than this. Though some may say it's foolishness, and I will become even more undignified than this. Leave my pride by my side, and I will even more undignified than this Though some may say it's foolishness And I'll become even more undignified than this Did you pull that one out of? That was just perfect today. Very good. Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now we get to worship God through the giving of ourselves and our gifts and our offerings. We're going to be following that with a time of prayer. And if you have a special prayer concern, celebration, uh, there are little slips of paper in the pew rack in front of you. You can put those down, either put your name or not, you have it anonymous, but you can drop that in the plate as it comes by as well. We'll collect those and share those during our prayer time in just a moment. Right now, let me invite our ushers to come and receive your gifts and offerings.
Thank you, God, for the ways in which you have blessed us, life and love and so many good things. As we give a portion back of our work, our effort, our energy, we pray that you would bless those who give and bless these gifts so that they may be blessings to others. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. We have several prayer requests here today. Um, we'll share these and uh, there may be other prayer needs or celebrations that are on your own hearts. But we have here that let us not damn others but celebrate the we, no separation by walls. This is from Chris. My brother-in-law, Paul, passed away unexpectedly yesterday. He was also Gene and Carl and Edie Kays and Nancy's cousin. Please pray for our whole family and love this life and the people in it. Amen. Prayers for all of those facing surgeries. From Marilyn Aikson, prayers for my brother Dick as he undergoes surgery on Tuesday. Cynthia is grateful that the DPS teacher strike is over with good resolution. Lori has for prayers for Kathy Huntington in the hospital with a brain bleed. Doctors are trying to find the cause for that. Mary Blue prays success for the special conference in St. Louis and for our delegate. We have our candle lit up there on the altar for our special general conference. It's going to be starting on Saturday, this coming Saturday. And Tim and Kathy Bradley are going as observers. They'll be they're participating at that special conference in St. Louis. Uh, we've had Doug Palmer, uh, part of our church. He is one of our lay delegates to that special general conference. So we pray for all of those who will be attending and will keep that candle lit. Uh, the conference starts Saturday and just runs through Tuesday, four days and some very important work will take place. I also want to lift up Rod Edmonds, and he's heading out. Yeah, I do, Rod. Um, he is heading out this week to the Texas coast to work with a volunteers admission team for the United Methodist Church on hurricane recovery, Hurricane Harvey relief, right? So our prayers go with you, safe travels, and thank you for doing that. That's very much appreciated. Well then, for these and uh, your own concerns and celebrations, as well as prayers of blessing on these prayer shawls that we have before us today, thankful for the folks who put these together. Uh, they just go to folks who need special care and people who need to know that we love them and we're holding them in prayer so they can wrap that and their, our prayers around them. Let's come together for a few moments in silence, and then we'll share in prayer together.
Lord, we have mentioned these prayer concerns. We lift them up to you. We pray for those who are grieving today, especially those unexpected deaths. Be with those who are facing surgeries. Be with those who are under doctor's care and pray that you'll help bring health back to them. Thank you for the end of the strike for the teachers and the Denver public school system, but we pray for teachers all across our state. We thank you for them and for how they do their jobs with so much integrity, so much compassion. Lord, we pray for those who make these special shawls. But Lord, we pray even more for those who receive them. That you would envelop them with your love and grace. Be with all of those delegates, the official delegates and those observers and the reserves and all who will be participating in our special general conference in St. Louis this week. We pray that you would give us grace and give us a sense that you are still God in the midst of sometimes turmoil within our church like that, within our denomination. We're so grateful that this place here, this, this church home, people feel welcome. They know that they are loved. May we continue to be a beacon of that love here in Longmont to others. Thank you for those who go and, and share their skills and their time and their talents in order to bring relief to disaster hit areas. For all of those who will be making the volunteers and mission trip to Texas, grant them safety. And may they not only help rebuild homes or whatever, but build new relationships. Your love, God, is awesome. And we don't know always how best to respond to it. So let us just say thank you right now in our own hearts, for the love that we ourselves have experienced. All these things we pray in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. celebrate communion, and we invite to the table that Christ has prepared for us all those that Christ loves. And that means you. You're invited to come. You don't have to be part of this church or of any church. In a few moments, the ushers will direct you to come down the outside aisles where there'll be people standing with loaf of bread and a cup of juice. You'll be handed a piece of bread that you can dip into the cup and 
partake that way. There are also gluten-free options on each one of these speaker stands over here for those who need that. Once you've received, you can come and kneel at the altar if you so desire for a few moments and then return back to your seats through the center aisle here. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his disciples and he took the bread and blessed it and broke the bread and gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God, thank you for these gifts, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would bless and consecrate the bread and the juice so that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ in order that we can be the body of Christ in this world. Make us one with you and one with each other in ministry until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast together at that heavenly banquet. These things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Will those who are serving please come now. You're invited to come.
Let us pray. God, we thank you for this mystery. You have fed us and nourished us by your very spirit. And now we pray that as we have been strengthened, we may be strengthened for the task to which you call us, to go and give our lives for others. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. would invite you, if you're able, to stand for our closing hymn this morning. And now, friends, go to share and enjoy life in all of its fullness and exuberance. Go knowing you are dearly loved children of God. Amen.